get started. We're going to start on section three. And just so you guys know, um, we're going to do chapter eight and chapter nine, a combined test. So after we finish chapter eight, we'll just start right into chapter nine. Okay. And we'll have one big test over all of them together. It'll be worth the same amount as a regular chapter test. Okay. So, um, one thing that we have to talk about is how mining is going to transform the West. If you don't have that written down, mining, that will be on your worksheet. Whether it was uh, mining gold or silver, it's really going to shape how the Western United States was formed because mining towns popped up. Uh, you know, maybe this is an area where they found gold. So there, you've got thousands of people rushing here and overnight you have a giant city that has developed. And these, uh, these new cities are often very ill-equipped for all the new settlers because, I mean, if you just built a hotel overnight, chances are it's like a giant tent with cots in it. It's not a legitimate building. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that happened. They would have hotels, they would have saloons, they'd have barber shops, grocery stores, post offices, and they were all just big tents. And because this is the Wild West, and a lot of times we don't have law enforcement, we start to get what are uh, known as vigilantes. These are self-appointed law enforcers, maybe because they have the most guns, maybe because they're the meanest. Um, if you have heard of Wyatt Earp, he was uh, the movie Tombstone. Any of you guys seen that? Oh, it's a great movie. You need to watch it, definitely. Um, maybe a more modern day example of a vigilante, Batman. Batman was not a cop. He was not a detective. He didn't work for the government, but he chased down bad guys. And that's what vigilantes did. They took the law into their own hands. Now, hopefully you have a good vigilante who does good stuff and gets the bad guys. But if you have someone who takes advantage of the system, not so good. Okay. Um, and vigilante will be on your worksheet as well. Some of the towns, they did have marshals, they did have sheriffs, but not all of them did. Um, and these towns, many of them were boom towns. As long as people were finding gold and silver, the town was awesome. It was big, it was thriving. But as soon as the gold and the silver ran out, it busted, okay? Um, so some of these towns, you may not have heard of them before. Leadville, Colorado, which by the way, is a great place to go on vacation. Very scenic and beautiful. Um, Nevada City, Montana. They were huge cities for a time until the mining collapsed. And lots of these cities are very diversified because you have people not just in the United States, you have people from all over the world that are coming to these areas to try and get rich quick. So some of these diverse cities, Denver, Boise, uh, places that you hear of today, they grew out of this mining boom. Okay. Oh, did y'all? Sorry. Denver, Boise, Helena. Okay. So the first mining was done by individual people. You know, they go out there, they pan for gold, they dig in the dirt a little bit. And at first, you could find some of these minerals on the surface or in the stream beds. But over time, you know, that gets picked clean. And so if you want to find gold and silver, you're gonna to have to dig deep. And that's when big companies take over because one individual person doesn't have the money or the resources or the ability to dig thou or hundreds of feet below ground. So you have to have big companies that do have those resources and they're gonna do that. And in many of these mines, they had Mexican and Chinese laborers who did lots of the heavy lifting and these people are unfortunately discriminated against. But one of the things about mining, it really, really contaminated the water, okay? Because if you've ever seen them like dig up any of these minerals underground, you know, they're covered in dirt and all kinds of other stuff. And so they immediately like wash them with water. All that water runoff goes into the water supply. And imagine, you know, if you're in Leadville, Colorado or something and you're mining lead, that's all running off into your water supply. Ugh. Okay. Um, and the mining wealth, it fuels industrial development because, you know, all of the tools and machinery that they use to dig down deep into the earth, that creates innovation and um, innovate or innovation. I said that twice. 
Okay, now the Transcontinental Railroad. This will be on your worksheet. It is the railroad that connected the Eastern United States with the Western United States, and it was owned by private businesses. But these private companies did get help from the government in the form of land grants. This will be on your worksheet. This will be on your test. Land grants, it's basically when the government just gave a big track of land to a railroad developer so they could build on it. Free land. Um, the government also gave loans to businesses. Many of those were not repaid. And uh, the two lines that you need to know, the first is the Central Pacific Line. It started over here in Sacramento, California, and they started building east. And it was mostly built by Chinese laborers. The Union Pacific Railroad, on the other hand, it started over here in Omaha, Nebraska, and they moved west. And the goal is for these two railroads to, you know, be here and start working and closing the gap and eventually meet in the middle. The Union Pacific was mostly built by Irish laborers, and the construction of these railroads was so expensive and it was so very dangerous. Reason why? There's a mountain range right here. I don't know if you guys were aware of that, but there is a mountain range. So you can't go around it. You have to blast through it. Dynamite is expensive and it's a tad bit dangerous. So I've heard, you know. So uh, there were people who died in, in the process of building these railroads. But um, once they were finally built in 1869, the two railroads connected at Promontory, Utah. Okay. Promontory, Utah, they had a big ceremony where the president had like a gold spike and he drove it into the, into the railroad to complete it. Um, unfortunately, like many of the Chinese laborers, they were not allowed to like, take part in the ceremony or even be there because they looked different. So, racist jerks. Anyhow. Now, railroads intensified settlement because you can get a lot more people out to the west really quick. You know, before when people would have to go all the way across the country in wagons, go across the Rocky Mountains in a wagon, it could take months. Okay, we're going to shorten that time to maybe a week or two. Okay, a lot shorter. And uh, this causes more industrial development. The, the railroad created innovation in other areas. And it tied the nation together. Okay, you know, it's a big country. And the railroad makes it easier for us to all be a part of this country because we're in communication and, you know, contact with one another. It also stimulated the growth of towns and cities. We talked about this. Radiator Springs. Radiator Springs was not built on the interstate. It turned into a ghost town. But if you're built on the interstate or the railroad, you're going to be awesome. Super successful. And so because we had so many people moving west... Lots of places are like, hey, let's become a state. Let's join the United States of America. Well, in order to do that, you had to have 60,000 people. Once you met that requirement, then you could write a constitution and apply for statehood. And between 1864 and 1896, there were 10 territories that applied for statehood to our country. Okay, so that just shows you how rapidly the West is growing. Now, one thing I want to point out, a lot of the southwestern United States, that was actually Mexico, and then we took it from Mexico. So the people that are living there, they've been there for decades, maybe even centuries, but now they're living in a different country, okay? Um, and those Mexicans who lived there, they've been raising cattle efficiently for a long time, okay? The Texas Longhorn, for instance. You know, in Texas, it has long horns, hence the name. But anyhow, they practice the open range system. Put a star next to that, that will be on your worksheet. In the open range system, your property's not fenced in. The cattle, they just roam, you know, wherever. Thousands of acres, just awesome. wherever. So, how do you know which, whose is whose? Brand. They brand them. They brand their cattle, okay? They hold them down, they get a hot iron, and... We actually, when we branded our cattle, we used to not do the hot iron. We would freeze brand them, which I, mean, I guess it still hurts, but I don't know. 
there's different ways. Anyhow, uh, the ranchers would brand their cattle, and then when the spring came, they would have uh, these cowboys round up their cattle. Okay? Now, vaqueros, you need to know this word. That is a Mexican cowboy. Okay? You know the spurs and the boots and all that kind of stuff. That's not really American culture. We stole that from the Mexican cowboys, the vaqueros. Okay? But these guys, they would round up the cattle in the spring, and then... Um, they would drive them to the cow towns, okay? And this process of rounding up the cattle and driving them across the country, this might take weeks, if not months. Imagine if you're down here, like El Paso, Texas, you've got to drive your cattle all the way across the state of Texas, Oklahoma, to Dodge City, Kansas. That's gonna take a while, okay? But the, the reason they did that, that's where the railroad was. Once you got them to the railroad center, they could load the cattle up, send them east, and that's where they would get slaughtered. Now, once the cowboys got to these cow towns, this is where they were gonna get paid, okay? Um, one of, probably the most famous cow town, Dodge City, but, you know, after weeks of being out in, on the prairie, eating crappy food, hanging out with these cowboys and all these cows, you finally get paid and you're like, man, what am I gonna do? So, they'd have rodeos. They'd have rodeos. This is where the cowboys would show off their cowboy skills, you know, who's best at what. They do roping, they do riding, you know, all different kinds of stuff that's in the rodeo today. Uh, Bill Pickett, he is actually credited with inventing bulldogging, which is where you ride the horse and then you kind of jump off or some of them look like they fall off and they grab the steer and then they like wrestle it down and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, they also have the events where they just rope the steers or, you know, they got the barrel racers and all that kind of stuff or, you know, all that cool things. But that's what the cowboys like to do. Now, the downfall of the open range system. Reasons why we don't have just cattle roaming everywhere anymore. Barbed wire. Barbed wire was invented and now you can fence in your land. Because you guys probably know just as well as I do, just a regular wire fence is not gonna keep anybody in, okay? My goat buttons can get out of that jerk. We had tore up our fence gonna butcher him okay and then on top of that the supply of beef exceeded the demand uh, there were so many cattle that they flooded the market like it was way easy to get beef and because there was so much of it the price of it dropped and so that's gonna hurt cattle farmers and then on top of that there's the extreme weather you guys live in Oklahoma you know if you were driving a whole herd of cattle across Oklahoma you might wake up and it might be 90 degrees outside. And the next day, it might be 35. You might have a tornado, you might have a blizzard. You really have no idea, okay? That's the extreme weather. And probably one of the biggest things in the Great Plains was the lack of water. Sometimes it doesn't rain. You guys, we, you, we've had summers like that. The water sources dry up. And if you have a thousand cattle and no water, they're gonna die. So that may not be a good option to walk them across the state of Texas, okay? So farmers, they started to fence in their cattle and they started to raise hay instead of letting them roam all over the place. You get that, okay. So lots of farmers are moving to the plains and um, we've mostly talked about miners, but miners and ranchers both. There's people, they're just looking for a better life, better way of living. You may not know this, that um, there were actually agents who went to Europe and they recruited people to come live in the West. They would say, hey, you know what? Like in Scandinavia, which is Northern Europe, they'd be like, hey guys, there's lots of free land in, in the Americas, come on, you can become farmers. And they're like, okay, let's do it. So they came to America. There were people who, that's what they did. They recruited others. And the reason that there was all this land 
is because of the Homestead Act of 1862. This will be on your worksheet. It will be on your test. Put a star or highlight it. Homestead Act is similar to the Dawes Act that we talked about yesterday, but the Dawes Act was for the Indians. The Homestead Act will give 160 acre plots of land to just about anybody, okay? The rules were you had to, once you got the land, you had to live on it for five years. You had to dig a water well and you had to build a road to get there and it's yours. It's a pretty good deal because 160 acres of land today, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. But here's the thing. Most, most of the jobs that are in the Western United States, they're male occupations. Like you're not gonna see a lot of women down working in a, in a gold mine, or you're not gonna see women driving cattle in a cattle drive. That's not gonna be something that's typical. So it's, it's kind of lonely out there. But, uh, you know, people still thought it was a great opportunity. So there's this guy named Benjamin Singleton. He was a black businessman who lived in Tennessee, and he's like, you know what? Because I'm black, people in Tennessee, they treat me like crap, and I'm tired of it. He'd had enough, okay? He wasn't going to take it anymore. So he created a group of people, and they called themselves Exodusters. That will be on your test. That will be on your worksheet. You might want to highlight that, okay? Exodusters. They get their name from the Bible, the book of Exodus, you know, Moses, it's, yeah, Noah's the ark, Moses is Egypt. Okay, Moses, he led his people out of, out of slavery and out of Egypt. That's what Benjamin Singleton is doing. He got a group of black people and he led them out of Tennessee and he said, let's go settle in Oklahoma and Kansas. Let's create our own communities. Let's start fresh. So a lot of them did and they formed um, historically black communities. You know, white people could live there, but, you know, it was mostly black people. Okay. But life on the homestead, like if you lived out in the West, it was difficult. Okay. First of all, there's the severe weather. You guys deal with that. You know what an Oklahoma spring is like. It's miserable sometimes. And then there's the loneliness. Okay. You may not have another neighbor for 15, 20 miles. And you know, some of you might think, oh, that sounds good, but imagine this. I was stuck with my husband and Coach Lowry for 365 days straight, not seeing anybody else. 365 days, my husband and Coach Lowry. That's enough for anybody to want to punch themselves in the face. You know what I'm talking about, okay? loneliness and if you're a single person out there trying to date somebody good luck with that okay also look at this picture this is what it looks like out there there's no trees to get lumber teachers if you will start having your kids get on their chromebooks and test the internet for me please thank you somebody else can do it we're good Okay, so lack of lumber to build homes. So what are you gonna build your house out of? Well, let's see. There's dirt and there's grass, let's do that. Hence, a sod home. Circle that, that'll be on your test. Okay, a sod home is basically you find yourself a little hill, you kind of dig out the hill, and it's a house made out of grass and dirt. So. Um, if you like snakes and spiders, you're in good shape because I guarantee you there's going to be some in your house. So now 365 days of snakes, spiders, my husband and Coach Lowry. Okay. All right. And necessity becomes the mother of invention. Uh, barbed wire. You got to keep your cattle in somehow. That's how they did it. Uh, the plow. Now, it's not like they invented the plow. That thing's been around for a while. But, you know, they made advancements and um, they bettered the technology that they had. Also, a grain drill. Now you don't have to individually dig a hole, plant a seed, cover it up. You got this little machiney, machiney, machine that will do it. It's a little dilly bobber. And the windmill. And this blows people's mind every year when we talk about this. Windmills are not originally meant to be decorative. Okay. A windmill, you know how the wind spins it? That's what pumps the water for your well. Yeah, the 
blows people's mind. I, you guys don't seem shocked, so hopefully that's something that you knew already. But some people, they didn't know that. And then we have the Morrill Act of 1862. Uh, this granted land to states for establishing agricultural schools. Like Oklahoma State University, they have a moral hall. It's a building on campus named after this, this act because the federal government gave them land to build their schools so that they could study and teach people about agriculture. Okay, now there's some economic rivalries in the Great Plains. Um, first of all, you got the cattle farmers. They're cattle, they're just grazing around. And if they don't have them fed in, they may eat your crops. Like maybe Charlie has grown all this wheat. I'm just like, ah, oh, my cattle are roaming free. I ate, my cattle ate all of Charlie's wheat. Not me, I didn't eat it, okay? All right, and then I'm like, well, I, my cattle had to eat Charlie's wheat because Carter over here, he's a sheep farmer and his sheep ate all the grass. And when they eat the grass, like they don't just eat it, like they eat it down to the dirt. Well, prairie maggots hate sheep. But anyhow, so I'm ticked at Carter because my cattle don't have grass to eat because his sheep ate all of it. Charlie's mad at me because my cattle ate her crops. And then we're all butthurt at the people who are mining silver and gold. Well, let's say that's Jacob because he's running, rinsing all of his minerals and stuff. And then he's just sending all of his contaminated water into our water supply, poisoning the sheep, which that's fine. Poisoning the cattle, that's what I'm worried about, and my drinking water. So, you know, we're all ticked off at each other, but we're all super mad at Jacob. But no matter who wins or loses, the Native Americans get screwed. I mean, that's all there is to it, because all this land we're talking about, it's all theirs in the first place, and the government's just like, they're like Oprah. If you guys have ever seen Oprah, she's like, you get a car and you get a car and you get a car. The U.S. government's like, oh, that's Indian land. Let me take that. Let me take that. You get land and you get, oh no, you're an Indian. You don't get land. You get land and you get land. And it's just like, oh, dang gum. Anyhow, now prejudice and discrimination. On top of all the economic rivalries, this is the biggest problem, Okay. The Plains are home to 80% of our nation's Asian, Mexican, and Indian populations. And you guys know, people hated on them all the time. And only 20% of the U.S. population lived in the Plains. But, you know, that small group of white folks that were out here in the Great Plains and in the West, they discriminated against those, those other groups. And you might circle this. Different ethnic groups, this is the biggest problem because they created fear and distrust. You know, different ethnic groups, they have different practices and cultures and beliefs, but people are always afraid of what's different. Instead of taking the time to try to understand their culture, they're just all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, like they're bad. They're bad or they're stupid. Like, don't be a butthole, okay? Um, and large cities had open discrimination. Like they would say, uh, we don't serve Indians here, or no Mexicans allowed, just because of the way they looked. Don't worry about the El Paso Salt War. It's not on your test or your worksheet. I don't really care about it. <laughs> Moving on. All right, you guys should all be familiar with this. April 22nd, 1889, Oklahoma Territory is opened up to the homesteaders. Now, remember, this was Indian land, so the government, you know, they took it all again. And then they said, hey, we're just going to hand it out to folks. We're going to go all Oprah on you guys. So we have two groups of people. First ones are the boomers. Boomers were people who charged to take their claim. So basically the government, they set up a starting line. And they said, at noon, everybody's taking off and they're going to go stake a claim. They can get whichever piece of land they want. Those people who tried to stake claims, they were called boomers. They were following the rules. Now, the other group of people, Sooners. These are people who snuck into the territory before it was officially opened, and they stole land claims. Okay? So, the reason we're called the Sooner State is because we were founded by a bunch of cheaters. I, I mean, they stole land. That's what they did. So, Boomer Sooner, I guess it's 
people who did it lawfully, and then we got the cheaters. It's a balance of both, I guess. But that's that's what it was. And so after giving away all this free land, by 1890, the frontier is gone. I mean, yeah, it's still kind of a wild west area, but there's no more free lands to give out. Okay? Um, and Mexican Americans who have lived in the same place for decades, if not centuries, now they're foreigners in their own land. And different cultural groups, they face discrimination. Oh. And that's all I have to say about that.